this is the first one. So when I when I talk to the the college students, I start out with this, and then I build from talking about all the. You're going to see slices of human heads and that kind of stuff. When I, I build from that, and then I start talking about the the perception from there. Um, basically, we have five senses. Sometimes they're called special senses, and they're broken down into physical and chemical. And our physical senses, touch, sight, hearing, all they're easy to relate to because it's something you can touch and see, right? You know, it's, it's either electronic or electromagnetic waves, but it's all a phenomenon, pressure wave, touching something cold, hot. Uh, smell and taste are chemical senses. We actually have chemical sensors in our heads that, that lead to our perception of, of smell and taste. And this is where the problem comes. You get in organic chemistry pretty quick if you're going to try to talk about this. Now, animals, or at least a lot of animals, have three different methods of smelling. The first one is the uh, vomeral nasal organ. What's the vomeral nasal organ? Not all animals have one. We don't have one, for instance. Horses, rats, hamsters, dogs, like cats, snakes. What's vomeral nasal? What does it do? I saw Rob came up with an idea. It's the pheromone receptor. Okay. What's a pheromone? When I talk to the freshmen, they usually get pretty excited about this. What's a pheromone? And that's not a hormone. It's a certain type of odorant that's used by some animals with a vomeral nasal organ that that uh, it relates some kind of a communication. Okay. And a lot of things in nature, humans. Not accepted. A lot of nature deals with sexual reproduction. So we, we, they, they, we get hung up on the fact that pheromones give a sexual response, but they do a lot of other things. So back in the 70s and 80s, if you were alive back then, or act, uh, I was about to say, uh, that's, I don't want to go there. They used to sell pheromone perfume. You remember that? It's supposed to drive the guys or the women crazy because... There was a lot of research that showed that there might be human pheromones, and there may be human pheromones, but we don't have a vermeral nasal organ. And by the way, it never worked for me, so it must not, you know, it must be hokey. Uh, so humans do not have the vermeral nasal organ, but they have the olfactory organ, and we also sense through a thing called the trigeminal nerve. If you slice the head in half, uh, our olfactory organ sits kind of up on top and toward the back of the, I guess that's your sinus, or the, the cavity behind your nose. When you smell, or when you take a normal breath, the air is going to come up, hit that or the, or the olfactory organ, and then go back down into the lungs. So when you sniff, when a dog sniffs, it's like really pushing up in there. So when you sniff at something, you're going to smell it stronger because you're getting more odorants to pass over your... It, it's simple physics so to speak. It's also the back of your, your uh, nasal cavity is connected to your mouth. So when you eat something and you breathe out, you're going to smell what you just ate. Okay? Does that make sense? When you breathe in, it's called a scent. Some people say it's called a scent. When you breathe out, it's called aroma. Okay? So when somebody says it has a nice aroma, that means they're breathing it through their mouth, right? Yeah. Actually, a lot of our sense of taste is actually our sense of smell. If I was to give you cinnamon and wouldn't let you, and close your nose off, you wouldn't basically would not taste anything. But it's the odorants and cinnamon that give it its smell. Okay. So the 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 aroma of, of foods and whatnot is very important uh, in our way we perceive smell. Okay, the olfactory bulb, what happens is the, the odorants go, first they dissolve into the mucosa, otherwise known as snot. Okay, these, these odorants have to dissolve into that. And then they do this really complicated number here. Um, there's actually a protein that binds to the odorants and you sense the, the and then there's going to be like an electrical response goes up through the nerves, okay. This is what causes this thing called odor fatigue. You can be over. You can overwhelm all those little proteins so they can't smell nothing anymore. Okay, 
how many of y'all are in a room they just re reinnovated? All right. When y'all walked in, what was the first thing you smelled? New carpet, paint. All right. You go in there now, do you smell it? It's still there because I got a headache when I woke up this morning. <laughs> so, which is actually kind of disconcerting, you know. I don't smell it anymore, but, you know, I, I know it's not formaldehyde because that's illegal, but there may be something there. So the more we smell something, you go into a florist, you're going to smell roses, right? And then you're going to be overwhelmed with the roses. You won't be able to... It, then, you, Which is really good because it would be bad for us, particularly when we're in the wild, if we smell nothing but scat, for instance, and there was a bear behind us, and we were so overwhelmed with this smell that we couldn't smell the other smell. So it's actually a, it's a good thing. Um, a lot of hog farmers, for instance, uh, Kim Brock, who runs our hog farm, He'll say, I haven't smelled hogs for 20 years. I don't know what these people are talking about. He can't. He doesn't smell anymore. It, his, uh, yeah. He can say, is that darn dairy down the road that's smelling? Is the horse farm? Is, is that horse urine? It's not my hog farm. Yeah. So you can, you can permanently damage your, your nasal or your, your ability. I was, I, when I was in college, I had a friend in the dorm who lived near a cement plant, and they actually ruined his sense of smell. But this is different than that. This, this is not physical damage. It's temporary. I don't know, but I think it's the protein language. It's also the ability to dissolve into the mucus. So there's a whole bunch of factors that work together. And I, and I think you're right, too. There's a, you burn out your, your electrical linkages, too. So, yeah, it's pretty complicated. So anyway, you go up, uh, you have these cilii, which sense, and you have a bunch of nerve endings. goes up through the uh, bulb into this olfactory gland, I think. It's, it's actually called the olfactory gland. It's actually sitting right on the bottom of your brain. Your nose is actually connected to your brain. So you hear somebody, sometimes people say, your sense of smell is hardwired to your brain. That's what they're talking about. Is actually right, I mean, is, you could say it's part of your brain, okay, the olfactory bulb. And we process smells through the, I always want to say the limbic, you know, like there was a lady from Spain, uh, limbic system, which is kind of the reptile brain, right? It's, it's our reacting, sensing brain. It's not our thinking brain. Uh, like I was telling Jackie, we have chickens. My wife is always worried about how our chickens feel, you know, and I say, they're, they're, they're a hypothalamus with feathers, you know. They're, they just barely have a reptile brain. They don't think, they don't feel, but they probably do have some rudimentary feelings. Uh, but anyway, it's, what's interesting about, because we process odors in the limbic system, it, the limbic system also is the, that we use, we take in like visuals and smells and whatnot, and it's what processes our memory. It sticks it up into the memory slots. So the sense of smell is really connected to memory. And it actually has a name. Again, I don't speak French, so it's the Proust or the Proust effect. Named for Marcel Proust, the uh, French author. He wrote a book called times, uh, Memories of Times Forgotten or Memories of Times Past. And a lot of, this, a lot of the story involved... I smelled this, I have a memory of, of the past. Okay, so that's how I got the name, the Proust effect. So, for instance, um, you all know Pavlov's dog. You know, you, he heard the ringing of the bell, they salivate when they got the food. Well, that's Pavlov's dog, because whenever I smell a lagoon, I get hungry. When I was in grad school at Iowa State, uh, I worked at the digester up on northwest of town, the old the beef nutrition farm. We had a digester up there, so I ride my bicycle up there. Like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I take my samples, I go home, and I eat dinner. So I got to identify the smell of anaerobic digestion, or lagoon, with eating. So I smell lagoon, I get hungry. To this day, 30 years later, I still get hungry. Uh, the other method that we, the other system we use to sense odorants is the trigeminal nerve which is all, it's a, kind of in the back of our brain. It's called trigeminal because there's Gemini, there's two of them. So it's like Gemini, two, the, the twins. It's twinned. 
And there's three of them. They're, they're tri-Gemini. Okay, there's three twins. There's the ophthalmic nerve, the maxillary nerve, and the mandibular. When you go to the dentist, they're deadening your maxillary and your mandibular nerves that go to the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve basically senses pain, heat, pain uh, responses, okay? But there are some parts of the maxillary root that, no, the, yeah, the maxillary root that actually have connectors into our olfactory bulb. So we actually can sense a lot of odor runts and a lot of odors through the trigeminal nerve. Notable about it is one of them that we do is menthol. What is menthol? What does menthol smell like? I was to come on. It smells like mint. It's what gives mint the smell of mint and the taste of mint. The aroma of menthol gives you the taste of mint. At small doses, it gives you kind of a cool feeling. You eat that, you take that wintergreen lifesaver and you suck in and you actually feel cool. That is actually your trigeminal nerve telling you this is cool. I'm, I'm sensing menthol. It gives you, if you were to take a lot of it in, peppermint, you would feel pain. In fact, uh, isn't there some, I guess it's the clove stuff that they, you can dead, try to deaden your nerves with. So that's basically using the same sort of thing. Another one we smell is capsaicin. What is capsaicin? Capsaicin? That's pepper. That's what Mexican food tastes, makes it taste like. The aroma of capsaicin gives Mexican food its flavor. And the more you have, the more it heats. And the more you got, it's pepper spray, right? So capsaicin is another one at small doses can smell like tortillas. Or not tortillas. Well, can smell like tacos. Strong doses can make, make you feel pain. Cetic acid. Vinegar. Uh, we got enough time. I usually I have these endless stories that the students never get fond of. I mean, uh, I said that wrong. Okay. When I was in high school, I had this job in a hospital, and we had this glacial acetic acid, which is 90% acetic acid. So I kind of was curious. I wondered what 90% acid vinegar smelled like. I opened the bottle, and it knocked me on my backside. I, I turned it blacked out. I found myself on the floor. That was my trigeminal nerve says, don't do that again. You know, it's uh, basically at very small doses. It's okay. At stronger doses, you're going to feel pain. Ammonia, the old smelling salts, the boxer gets knocked out, and you break the smelling salts. Trigeminal nerve says, get up. You know, you feel pain. You can't help but respond.